letter of James, the epistle of James, chapter 4 and verse 1. The epistle of James, chapter 4 and verse 1. And the word of God says, Where do wars and fights come from among you? Do they not come from your desires for pleasure that war in your members? You lust and do not have. You murder and covet and cannot obtain. You fight and war. Yet you do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask amiss that you may spend it on your pleasures. Adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you think that the scripture says in vain, the spirit who dwells in us yearns jealously, but it gives more grace. Therefore he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Therefore submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Lament and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning, and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up. Do not speak evil of one another, brethren. He who speaks evil of a brother and judges his brother speaks evil of the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge. There is one lawgiver who is able to save and destroy. Who are you to judge another? Come now, you who say today or tomorrow we will go to such and such city, spend a year there, buy and sell and make a profit, whereas you do not know what will happen tomorrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapour that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. Instead you ought to say, If the Lord wills, we shall live, and do this or that. But now you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. Therefore to him who knows to do good and does not do it, to him is a sin. Amen. An interesting chapter in the letter of James a chapter which I believe addresses many Christians and basically the whole world today. The question in the beginning um, probably gives the mood and the doctrine that we are expected to learn from this chapter. Where do wars and fights come from among you? So it seems that even in those times, this was an issue. An issue of fights, an issue of division, of an issue of not being like-minded or having the same um, goals, or even having um, a sense of kindness and unity with your brother or sister. And here the Word of God actually explains to us why we fight, why we quarrel, and why there is division among Christians especially. You know, um, it's unfortunate to think, and we probably all know this or have lived this, that there are many divisions in churches these days and you always hear of, you know, this certain denomination has five different um, types of churches and they've separated ways because they don't believe, believe in this or don't believe in that. And it's quite unfortunate when the unbelievers see Christians as people who cannot get along and the common thread in Christianity, of course, is love and acceptance and following God's will and work. And how is it possible that I'm saying that I know more about God or I've got God's will in my life, but the other person has it. And the other person says, well, I've got God's will and God's um, calling in my life and I know better. And it seems to confuse not only the world around us, but even Christians in our own churches. So where do wars and fights come from among you? The word of God is asking. And now the Word of God, the Holy Spirit, through James, is giving us the answer. And this is an answer from God. It's not, it's not a philosophy or an ideology or my point of view. It's what God is saying. God is actually telling us why there are fights. And the Word of God says, Do they not come from your desires for pleasure that war in your members? So in other words, God puts the blame in our carnal ways, in our proud ways, in our prideful manner, in our yearning and our, us wanting to always be right, or us pushing our thoughts as being the correct thoughts, our opinions, our ideology, and basically trying to convince everyone around us 
that we're right? Do they not come from your desires for pleasure that were in your members? Amazing sentence. It's who we are. If I'm fighting, it's coming from within. If I'm quarreling with someone, I'm arguing or trying to get my point through in an aggressive way or demanding way, it's because I have issues within me that are surfacing right now and are causing problems with the people around me. I'm not taking the humble way. I'm not taking the, the way of humility. And I am possibly raising my fists and stomping my feet, trying to be heard. And God says, that's why there are fights. That's why there are wars among you. Because you don't put on humility, as the word of God says. You don't hush. You're not silent. You don't even listen to what other people have to say. And verse 2 says, you lust and do not have. You murder and covet and cannot obtain. You fight and war. And that's a huge um, thing to say. You murder. But in reality, if we go to Matthew chapter 5 and verse 21, you see these are Jesus Christ's words. Apostle, Paul, Apostle James, through the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit speaking through Apostle James and is basically quoting what Jesus Christ said in, um, in the Gospel of Matthew. Chapter 5 and verse um, 21. You have heard that he said to those of old, you shall not murder. And whoever murders will be in the danger will be in danger of the judgment. But I say to you, whoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of judgment. Amazing. So Jesus Christ puts murder in the same level of me being angry and fighting and warring against my brother. Because why am I fighting against my brother? Why am I angry against my brother? You murder and covet and covet and cannot obtain. You fight in war, yet you do not have because you do not ask. So in reality, God is saying to us, you are fighting because you can't have what you're lusting for. In other words, you're not, you're not happy with yourself. You're not content with what God has given you. Your heart is not full of the presence of God. You're not in a position to be humble, full of love and patience. The Holy Spirit, the fruit of the Holy Spirit isn't in you and thus it's not coming out of you. And the only thing that's springing forth in your life is this lust of having things you, you don't have. And because you are lusting for these things and you're not having them, you're becoming angry and you're warring against your brother and you're actually jealous of your brother and you're creating all these things because of pride. And you you, you ask, it says in verse 3, and do not receive because you ask amiss that you may spend it on your pleasures. And this is where a Christian is, is asked to align himself, herself, with who God is. Sometimes we think that we go before God with a shopping list and we ask God or plead with God or try to convince God that he has to give us all that we want. Sometimes we have this misconception that prayer is me trying to make God do things in my life that I want him to do. And the word of God here is quite clear. You ask and you do not receive. So if I'm asking for things that I'm not receiving, it's possibly because I'm asking amiss. What I'm asking for has nothing to do with the will of God, but it has only to do with my pleasures. And if we look at the, the way that Christ taught his disciples how to pray, it puts it all in perspective, doesn't it? In this manner, therefore, pray. This is Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ said to his disciples, In this way you're going to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So basically, Christ wants us to pray to God that what that his will that is done perfectly in heaven to be done in my life. In other words, my prayer has to be aligned not with my desires, my lusts, and my carnal way, but my prayer has to be aligned with the desires and what God and what God wants. So I have to have God in my life. 
I have to be in dedication, devotion, reading the Word of God, being full of the Holy Spirit, having a connection with God, so that everything in my heart is actually coming from God. My prayers are directed from God. God is telling me what to pray for because He has planted that seed in my heart. Or rather, I have allowed God to live within me so my desires are coming from God's desires. So my dreams are God's dreams, in other words. And then when I do ask, I don't ask amiss. I'm not asking things so I can fulfill my pleasures, my desires. I'm not asking for the Lamborghini. I'm not asking for the for the mansion. I'm not asking to be rich and wealthy. I'm not asking for a million followers. But what I am asking for is for God's will to be done in my life. Just as Jesus Christ said to his disciples in the Lord's Prayer, let it be done on earth as it is in heaven. But give us this day our daily bread. Give me what I need to go on. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors very important. I am in a position before God where God gives me grace and mercy. God fills me with his love and peace and hope. I am so full, complete and fulfilled and perfect in Christ Jesus that I am able to forgive. I don't hold grudges. I don't start fights. I don't pick at things and make them bleed. Why? Because I don't need to. I've got no reason to war. I've got no reason to fight. I've got no, re no reason to divide anything with anyone because I'm complete in Christ Jesus. That's where Christ wants us to be. And in verse 4, the Holy Spirit puts things into perspective as how God sees it. And some might say this is quite extreme in the way um, God is actually um, calling out His people about the way they're acting and the way um, the way they're acting and the way they're, they're pursuing their things, he's actually telling them that they're like adulterers and adulteresses. He's telling them that you're acting like people who are not loyal. You're acting like a nation that is not loyal and is actually disloyal and following other things in your life. You have made other gods in your life. And that's the way he's... God spoke to the Old Testament to his um to his people. When they were worshipping idols, when they were following other gods, God called them adulterers. Because you're not faithful to me, God would say to them. You're not loyal to me. You are looking left and right and you're, you're, you haven't fixed your eyes upon me. Do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. So if you want to follow the world. If you want to follow the way of the world, let it be known, God says, you're an enemy to me. Because you're not loyal. My way is forgiveness. My way is love. My way is covering a multitude of sins. Your way is trying to fulfill your lusts and desires by fighting and wanting to be right. Having this need to be right all the time. Having this need to be heard. Having this need to be the centre of attention. And we're living in an age now where it's so important for everyone to express their opinions. You see people on Twitter and they're on their other social media platforms wanting to say what they believe or what they know and what is just and what is righteous. And God just wants a sort of hush. Be silent. Because the only one that has something to say is God. And that's all that matters. He is the beginning and the end. He's the Alpha and the Omega. What are we? What am I to say? What are you to say before God? And God says He, whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. If you want to be like the world, go. It's your free will. You can do so. But don't think that we are in a relationship anymore because you're following your heart. You're actually committing adultery according to how I see it, God says, because you're not loyal to me anymore. You're not fulfilling my doctrine. Jesus Christ said it quite clearly. If you love me, follow my commands. If you don't follow my commands, guess what? You don't love me. You can sing in church. You can prophesy in the squares in the square. You can go out in public and profess my name. But if you're not doing my commands, I, in the end, I'm going to say, I don't know you. 
I really don't know who you are because you've never done what I've asked you to do. I don't know you because you don't follow my commands. Yes, you profess my name. Yes, you sing my, my, my name in hymns. Yes, you're writing these beautiful songs about me. Yes, you're writing your books about me. But are you really doing what I'm asking you to, to do? Because that's all I care about, really. Your devotion and dedication depends on your actions. Depends on how you're walking before the Bible, before the Word of God, before my Word, God says. Or do you think that the Scripture says in vain, the Spirit who dwells in us yearns jealously? And it's true. God wants us all. He doesn't want a part of us. And yes, many times in the Old Testament we see that, that He's zealous or even jealous. And we saw that, we saw God's relationship with the people of Israel. How He wanted them to be a bride, a woman who was faithful and dedicated. But unfortunately, he would call them harlots. He would call them adulterers. Because why? Because they were, they were ready to give God up for anything that the world had to offer. And this is where it affects us as Christians, especially in this day and age. We're living in this, in this world where we are bombarded through everything and anything. How we should live our lives. How we've got people that are called now influencers, that they influence how we should live, how we should dress, how we should think, how we should speak. And God says, This is this is enmity to me. This is this is my enemies. This has got nothing to do with me. If you follow what I follow them, go for it. But you've got nothing to do with me. The spirit who dwells in us yearns jealously. We're making God jealous. We're not giving him our time. We're not giving him our devotion, our dedication. It's like a woman being married to a man. And she sees every single other person apart from him. She serves every single other man apart from him. Of course he's going to be jealous. And how much more when it's got to do with God, who gave his only begotten son, who gave everything he had in heaven for us. And yet we stand it unfaithfully before him and demand and ask and of course we don't receive and we just get angrier and angrier and of course we find ourselves frustrated where's God and what are you doing in my life but the question is what am I doing in my life with God where am I standing before God where is my love where is my care where is my dedication and above all where's my sacrifice it's a word we don't hear very often lately what do I sacrifice for God? And many times, you know, we hear various sermons. And it's all about what God can give us. And, you know, God can make you this and make you that. Successful, wealthy, rich, or whatever. But the question is, and it should be, what can I do for God? How can I express my dedication, devotion to Him? God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. And this is where it all comes together now because I'm fighting I'm proud if I war I'm proud if I just want to feel my lust and desires I'm proud and God will resist me God will not bless me there's a war I've built a war of pride and God can't touch me God can't bless me there's no way God will I, there's no way I will find favor before God when I'm proud but he gives grace to the humble. Many times we don't want to humble ourselves because we don't want the other person to get the victory. But the truth is, the victory comes when we do humble ourselves. And many times we see this in our lives, in our relationships, when there is a quarrel, there is a fight. The first one to humble themselves and repent, they're the winners. And let's be honest, whoever is a winner in a fight, no one, no one wins these things. There's no such thing as someone winning a fight. The only way I can win a fight is when I humble myself and then the grace of God comes upon me. And then I repent. And the more grace of God comes upon me. Then I fix my relationships. Then I ask for forgiveness. And then I reach out the hand. Then peace comes in my life, in my life, in other people's lives. And then everything changes. Therefore, submit to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. And if you are in a, in a situation where you're getting hounded, you're getting pounded, Someone's chasing you. Someone's bullying you. 
The word of God says, submit to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. So instead of me trying to take things in my own hands, I should submit myself to God and lay at God's feet my issue, my problem. God. I've got this issue. I'm humbling myself now before you. I'm humbling myself before everyone. I'm not going to take action. I'm not going to fight. I'm not going to war. But I'm coming to you and telling you that I need your help. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Don't fall into the trap of getting to that fight. Don't fall into the trap of trying to find justice. It's not going to happen. But submit to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, it says in 8, and he will draw near to you. Am I in this situation right now because I have forgotten God in my life? Have I lost God's grace and mercy in my life and I'm just, I feel like I'm sinking in strife all the time? I'm always offending someone, I'm always doing something wrong, I'm always found in situations where there's war and rage and fightings and, and gossip and everything's carnal. Why is my life like this? And God says, draw near to me. You're, you're far from me. You're far from my grace. You're full of pride. You're full of anxiety. You're full of fear. You haven't got my love inside of you anymore. You're striving and trying to do so many things on your own. And you're falling flat on your face. So draw near to God and I will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. You know, it's... When God says to you, cleanse your hands, you sinners, you really have to stop in your tracks and say, wait a second, what have I been doing? What do I need cleansing from? Now, I think the most difficult situation for a Christian is to realize where they're at and what they're doing. Where am I right now? Am I in a position where I need cleansing? Am I in a position now that I am, I'm entangled in a web that, I'm, that it's just causing all these problems in my life? Do I just need to cleanse my hands from all this? For whatever my hands is involved in, whatever I'm, I'm, I'm doing, whatever I'm, 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 I've immersed myself in, I'm trying to untangle myself. Maybe it's just cleanse my hands from this. Wash my hands from this. Just let it go. Let it go. And purify my heart. And don't be double-minded anymore. They think, oh, maybe it's this, maybe it's that. Because as people, as Christians, when we enter these fights and wars, we become quite paranoid. Did he say this? Did she say that? And we're quite double-minded. Yeah, he's a nice brother, but he does this. She said that, but... And we come, and, we, and we, we're getting crazy in our minds. Whispers, and why did he say this? And we're trying to read secret messages and read between the lines... And, you know, we should be pure. To the pure, everything is pure. And trust. And be loyal. Beautiful virtues that, sh virtues that should characterize a Christian. Not paranoia. Not double-mindedness. And God says here, lament and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. It's time to repent. It's time to put that sackcloth over your head. It's time to fall flat on your face. Ask God to draw near to you. Ask God to cleanse you, to purify your heart, to purify your minds. For me to stop having second thoughts and bad thoughts and a cloud over my head wherever I go. And just be free from these thoughts and and, and paranoid um, thoughts and, and whispers that come into my ears and maybe this and maybe that. And humble yourself in this side of the Lord and he will lift you up. And that is humility, isn't it? Accepting the fact that I've done wrong. Expecting, ex accepting the fact that the way I'm walking, it's not Christ's way. And just stopping my tracks, stopping everything. Stop me talking. Stop me um, getting to these wars and fights. Stop defending my case. Stop everything. Stop making up scenarios in my mind. What I'm going to say when he says this and she says that, then I'll say that. Stop all that. And just humble myself in the sight of the Lord so he can lift me up at last and free me from this web of rage and warring. And do not speak evil of one another, brethren. 
He who speaks evil of a brother and judges his brother speaks evil of the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge. And God gives us no right to speak evil of one another. I have no right to speak evil about anyone of my brothers or sisters. God doesn't give me that right. Because it says in 12, There is one lawgiver who is able to save and to destroy. And who are you to judge one another? So I can't judge anyone because there's only one lawgiver and one judge. I can't speak evil. I can't spread gossip. I can't say he did this and he did or she did that because God doesn't give me that authority. I haven't got that authority. The only thing I can do is humble myself. But he said this about me. So? So? Christ was crucified on the cross. He was laughed at, scorned. He was humiliated. I'm sure you're not, go, you're not going through that. I'm sure I haven't gone through that. So if Christ can forgive, if Christ can love in that situation, can't I accept someone gossiping about me? Someone spe- smearing my name? Can't I accept anything? Am I so prideful? Where's my humility? Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and He will lift you up. And that's what we need to do. It's all about humility. God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. If I want grace in my life, I have to humble myself. If I don't want God to resist me, I have to stop being prideful. I have to stop having the last word all the time. I have to stop thinking that I know everything. I have to stop being aggressive. I have to stop getting into people's faces. And I have to stop talking. Stop talking. Just stop talking. We don't need it. We don't need to say all these words all the time. Be wise. Hold our tongues. Hold our mouths. And James says it so so beautifully in this letter about the tongue and all the all the harm it does. It's such a small member of the of, of the body, but it does so much harm. So much harm. And it says in chapter 3 and verse 3, For we are stumbling many things. If anyone does not stumble in word, he is a perfect man, able to also bridle the whole body. So if I can hold my tongue, the word of God, God sees me as being perfect. Why? Because I've mastered it. I've mastered what makes me prideful. I've mastered what separates me from God. I've mastered and I've got authority over what can bring me down and out of God's grace. My tongue, my way, my lust, my pridefulness, my want to be right, my old self, basically. So where do wars and fights come from among you? They come from us. It comes from our carnal ways, our old selves that should have been buried in baptism. They come to life sometimes and we want to be right. The need to be heard. The need to be to be. In, you know, forefront, and everyone can see me and hear me, be the center of attention to show how smart I am or how wise I am. But God says, the only thing you need is my grace. And the only way you're going to get my grace if, if you humble yourself. He gives more grace. Therefore, he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. So let's put on humility today. Let's Resist the devil so he can flee from our lives. Let's lament and mourn and weep. Let our laughter be turned to mourning and our joy to gloom so we can repent, truly repent from our ways. Humble ourselves inside of the Lord so he can lift us up and do not speak evil of one another. Let beauty define us. Let's, let God's beauty define us. Our kindness to be our traits. Our love to be another trait. Our forgiveness, another characteristic that defines us as Christians. Let's be Christ-like. Let's be like Him. So we can be in that position where God can bless us. Where God will see us as people He wants to draw near to and introduce the world as His children. Let's draw near to God and He will draw near to us. Amen.